Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining us for this uh, in conversation session. Uh, there's no presentations. It's exactly as we suggest. Uh, Kate and I are going to have uh, an informal conversation and we're going to let the conversation lead us where it leads us. Um, I don't think Kate needs an enormous amount of introduction, but I'm, I'm going to do a little bit anyway. Um, Self-styled as a renegade economist. Um, she's been uh, positioning uh, content around how to make our societies fit for 21st century realities. Uh, the book, um, and it would be wrong if I didn't have one to hand, wouldn't it? The book, which is the English version, I believe. Um, the book has been translated into 20 languages across the world. Um, and in terms of formal appointments, uh, Kate's a senior associate at the University of Oxford Environmental Change Institute and a professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. So that's my introduction. Um, I want to kick off and I just have two questions to, to set the scene perhaps. And then, and then as I said, we'll, we'll let this go wherever it, it leads. Um, and if people are uh, minded that in our discussions, they want to pose questions, then please pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to, to, to segue them into the discussion. Um, we are particularly interested in the research team that I lead about understanding circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about two states, a, a, a transitional state, which we'd like to think we're in at the moment. And then we talk about this kind of transformed state, the destination, if you like. So from your perspective, what does a transformed circular economy look like to you? So it's going to be one in which, I mean, I can just repeat the, the, the basics of the concepts of circularity, where waste from one process becomes food for the next, where we use Earth's resources far more collectively, carefully, creatively and slowly. And of course, we'll be going back in many ways to economies that our grandparents and great grandparents knew very well in the sense of biological materials that we used again and again. To me, what's the major thing that's different this time is the introduction since, say, 1950s of mass plastics and other human made uh, materials from persistent organic pollutants to nuclear waste. Uh, how do we eliminate those things that can't be circular and how do we create circular loops that mimic nature's regenerative powers with the human made or technical materials that we inherit. So that's completely unprecedented. But a lot of it, I think we can learn and relearn from the past. So I don't know if you ask me what's going to look like, what's going to feel to walk down the street. I'm delighted to say I don't know, because I think we can impose our inherited 20th century imagination of industry just with a few loops on it. But there's no way it's going to look like that. And that's what I think is so exciting about it. It's going to be incredibly creative of how we transform not just where resources flow and how they're used, but all the questions around ownership um, to service use. Uh, in my own family, we recently got rid of our car in January and I now use a car scheme. And to me, that's part of being part of a circular economy, one of the ways of shifting. But that doesn't look like circularity. But it, and, and I think it's the only the beginning of how it's going to transform the way we have a sense of how we belong and what we share and who, you know, how objects belong in our spaces. So I don't know what it's going to look like. And I, I love it every time a, a new innovation comes along and you're taken aback. I remember the first time I saw an electric car plugged in on a lamppost in my neighborhood. It's that moment of that's a first. And now it's going to become part of the new normal. I can't wait to see more of these firsts. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, we see obviously other movements, um, the sustainability movement being one, the eco innovations movement being another. Responsible innovation is, is a theme that, that crops up a lot in our conferences. Um, how do you think that these might differ from uh, a circular economy or, or do they differ? Is, is there any difference in your view? So there's so many different ways people use language or labels to distinguish what their group is doing. And sometimes that can be really um, empowering and exciting and energizing. And actually donut economics falls exactly into that, right? What, what I call donut economics in a very kind of playful way, other people might call well-being economies, regenerative economies, circular economies, um, and I think it's, it's, it's valuable to use this language because I think we're searching. And I think as we're evolving in our concepts, our language will evolve. As things evolve, the first thing that nature does in evolution is to diversify and try out lots of different variations. And these different variations pop up and then some of them get amplified. So I think we're at a stage of lots of language coming out around 
cycles. Let me put it in the broadest sense. I think it's also really, really important not to get embedded in camps. I'm circular economy, your regenerative economy, your well-being economics, and I'm community wealth building in your deep ecology. And, and these camps set off against one another because they don't use the right nuance of language. And, and that is the way that actually this evolving edge and the huge bigger team and the bigger movement that I think we're all part of can split itself and destroy itself from within. So I, I really like embracing a lot of language. But if you're asking me what's sort of, how do I see things nested within each other? To me, the word regenerative is at the top layer. So when I talk about doing donut economics, we need to move from degenerative to regenerative industrial systems and indeed mm -hmm. agricultural systems. And I see circular economy as a particular way of thinking that is very much part of regenerative design and essential. I don't think you could do regenerative design unless you included within it the principles of circular economy. So I celebrate all those different languages and I don't get caught in, I just don't put my energy into slicing them up and distinguishing all between them because I think this is big teamwork and it's really important to recognize yourselves as part of that big team, different, different people bringing forward different concepts and aspects of it, but it all interconnects. I don't know, what, what, I wanna know what you think on that. I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. I, I find it's difficult to keep having conversations that create an argument about whether sustainability is the overarching umbrella and circular economy is a fad that's nested in it, or whether circular economy is bigger and, and sustainability. And, and to try and kind of make sense of it, I think I've looked across at, uh, at the relationship between um, companies and their stakeholders and their shareholders. And I can see that, and, and I can see that there's definitely an expectation in our linear economy that we reward our shareholders in one particular way. And that if we're going to move to a bigger concept, circular economy is that concept, we've got to kind of change that. And then I also think about it in terms of this regenerative challenge in exactly the same way that you've said, you know, we can't keep pretending that we're going to do 10% less bad next year and 20 percent less bad the following year and be because you know to pinch the words of Gunter Pauli you know really um you know a 20 percent reduction in pollution is still pollution uh, an 80 percent reduction in in um inappropriate uses of earth's resources is still 20 percent inappropriate use of resources so so we've got to get to a much quicker and a much faster message and so when I came across the chapter in your book around regenerative by design, I thought that was a really nice phrase because I quite often bump into design thinking and a range of other design philosophies, cradle to cradle and, and, and those sorts of philosophies that perhaps aren't focused on regenerative quite yet. So I think for me, the circular economy is 100% well, actually it's, Nothing's going to be 100%, but the definition aligns 100% with this idea of regenerative. It, it's add, time we. Can, sorry, on. can I add in two yeah. things on this point before we go on to another? Because it's really important. So, you've brought in. So, one, I think, so on the sustainability versus regenerative, I would go for regenerative. And one of the reasons is because sustainability can be interpreted as sustaining, keeping things, you know, making sure we don't run things down from where they are. But of course, we are living on a planet that has been profoundly run down. And so I think the power of using the language of regenerative is recognizing the starting point, which is we're massively overshooting many planetary boundaries and local ecological boundaries. We have degraded, we've inherited a degraded Earth system. And therefore, the first act is of restoration, of repair and healing and bringing something back. Whereas sustaining risks making it sound like, well, the baseline is what it is and we just need to sustain it at its capacity so that I think that's valuable for one reason and then another issue around why this language keeps shifting and you brought it in by talking about companies is because of course companies will come along and try and capture it and so the words get captured over time and people get frustrated they you know I've heard people say sustainable development that's so corporate capture and whereas for other people say no no this is the top concept of what I'm aiming for and when people feel the language has been captured and, and co-opted and greenwashed then they won't use it anymore and I think that's also partly why people keep moving on and so I like the word regenerate again because it brings us it, it fixes in our minds the fundamental metrics and cycles that we're thinking about about the living world so invoke life eco-linguistics will say invoke life and if we start with the metrics of the living world then we root our 
aspirations and goals and standards in living systems and then we invite business to make itself compatible with that rather than starting with as you said you know what shareholders have come to expect is a normal return for them double digit please if we can uh, and, and taking finance and extraction as a norm it roots us back in the living world so i talk about being regenerative by design is working with and within the cycles of the living world and it requires us first to understand them we must all learn the basics of ecology before we can learn any economics, right? Understand the household before you claim to even start managing the household. So I think that's a really political, politically important point about the language and why people keep moving that language. Okay, so um, I'm I'm going to head off in the greenwashing direction in a minute, but I'm going to I'm going to avoid that just for a a, a moment. Um, and I've put a little note in because Sally has a great question but there's an abbreviation of MM so if she can help me with that that will help me answer that question but back to where I want to take you I'd like to take you back to thank you very much Sally um, I'd like to take you back to the kind of fundamental economics what would be the three things that you would change in our expectation of um, our kind of economic theory that dominates the planet well, you know, if you had to if you had well it's a three wish question you've had three wishes to shift economics dramatically, what would those three wishes be? Oh my goodness, three wishes to shift economics. Okay, please, every economics tutor in the world, when you are teaching first class of economics, don't start where every class seems to have started over the last 50 years. Welcome to economics, here is supply and demand, which is just the absolute standard thing. And it puts, price, it puts the market at the center of our vision as if suddenly the economy is the market. That's a massive assumption. And it puts price as the metric of concern, which means that everything that falls outside the price contract by definition is called an externality. And economists accept this definition and say, well, of course, yes, uh, that externalities matter. And I say, well, if they matter, why would we go around talking about the near death of the living world that we're inducing as an environmental externality? To me, that alone tells us this framework does not serve our times. And the mental framework is completely inadequate for the reality that we face. So number one, don't start with the market, start with the embedded economy. The economy is embedded in society, embedded in the living world. It means economy is a social construct. We can change it and reinvent those relationships and um, means of interaction and the mechanisms that we invent. We can reinvent markets in the state and the commons. So that's number one. Number two, I think in the, well, the goal of the economy so the goal of the economy, again, it's so deeply embedded in 20th century thinking that it's never drawn, it's never explicitly discussed, but it came to be, as you hear in every politician's speech and every macroeconomics class, it came to be endless economic growth. And it was presumed to be endless, no matter how rich a nation is already. I'm sitting in the UK, one of the richest countries in the world, richer than countries have ever been before us, and yet all of our governmental policy, all of our economics teaching is is shaped on the assumption that the solution to the UK's problems lies in yet more growth. And there's something absurd about that. So at what point can economy say, we have gone through the growth phase and now it is time to grow up because that is true of everything in the living world. Nothing in nature thrives by trying to grow endlessly. It destroys itself or the system on which it depends. So why would we think our economy is gonna be the one outlier from that? So then instead of having endless growth as a, an implicit, what I call a cuckoo goal that creeps into the nest and kicks out other things, what is the goal? And let's make it explicit. And of course, I, you know, here's one I made earlier. I said, well, how about this as a goal? Meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And, and if you don't agree, fantastic, because now we're actually having a conversation about it and we can reshape this, but let's have a, an, a goal. Because if we don't have a goal, how on earth do we talk about success of the economy? How on earth do we measure the success of any one policy? And if we're going to get into this goal, Here's my third wish. We need to transform our idea of the dynamics. So poor Simon Kuznets, brilliant, brilliant 1950s economist who came, I'll keep it short, but he, he looked at US, um, America, American, UK and German data on what was happening to inequality over time. And it looked like over time as economies grew, they got more unequal, but then things evened up. And he was really surprised but it came out as what's called the Kuznets curve. And it implies that if, you know, as an economy grows, it gets more unequal, but then things will even up again. And it says everything against redistribution. Don't redistribute, you'll get in the way of growth and growth will even things up again. And then in the 1990s, economists picked this idea up again. They looked at some local air and water pollution data. They said, whoa, we think the same thing's happening with the environment. As your economy grows at first, pollution will increase, but don't worry, then it will clean up again. 
And of course, that environmental Kuznets curve, I think, has been phenomenally damaging because the picture, the power of pictures, the picture is so simple, it sits in our minds. And it under, has underlain decades of environmental training and belief that as economies grow, first pollution increases, but then it decreases. And when you move from the local to the global, that is not at all true. Nations, ecological footprints and carbon footprints just rise with GDP unless governments take very concerted action to start trying to bend that curve. And so we need to create economies that by design are regenerative and distributive. So that was my third wish. That was quite a lot of wishes, wasn't it? They're great wishes. They're great <laughs> wishes. If I wish I had a little lamp and I could, I could <laughs> virtually send it to you and you could give the lamp a little rub and off we went with the genie. Um, I'm going to hop across to a question that's come from Sally Davenport, um, who's in New Zealand. Um, she said, Donut Economics and uh, Mariana Mazakuto's uh, mission-led stuff is gaining such traction internationally. She even credits that she's heard of it in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> we, we understand the why, but there seems to be, be a big question about how. So, so this question is about taking you from the macro and kind of your wishes, but and down into the kind of the micro, the, the how do we look, how do we implement these ideas at ground level, do you think? Oh, okay, so first of all, so, so it's not how is this taking traction? So let me just go to the point of New Zealand, actually. Um, I'm not at all surprised that um, it's heard of and got traction in New Zealand. Of course, I'm delighted by that. And I think it's got good parts to do with the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, who I've heard saying in public, she's read Donut Economics and it reinforced a lot of what she already thought. So she's thinking like this. She's one of the few national leaders who've said, we're going to create a well-being economy. Let's produce a well-being budget. So in my mind, she's one of the strong examples of a national leader who said, let us give an intentional goal to our economy and it is not endless growth. And therefore then let's try and put this into practice. So that makes sense to me. But how do we do this at the national level? Well, I think you have to do it by starting to do it just as, as Jacinda Ardern has started doing. So let's have a well-being budget. Let's, let's let have the leaders speak to this vision of this is what we are aiming to do. Let's create budgets that actually start to reflect this in how we spend public money. But also I think, and I, and I don't know enough about what's going on in New Zealand, but I think let's put in place legislation and regulation that stands behind the message we're giving. So the Netherlands has said, we're gonna be 100% circular by 2050. That's a wild ambition. And I, you know, everyone on this call must be thinking, what does 100% circular mean? To me, that's like, let's, you know, Kennedy, let's go to the moon. We don't know how to get there, but we're only going to figure out how to get there if we try. Not by sitting here saying, well, we can't go because we don't know how. Let's try. And by the way, we'll come up with some amazing innovations on the way. So the Netherlands says, let's be 100% circular by 2050. But what I really like is they say, well, let's be, let's be 50% circular by 2030. So that's really serious ambition within less than a decade. And I know the city of Amsterdam have said, well, let's have all built environment tenders are going to be circular by 2023. And in 2022, next year, 10% of all government procurement will have circularity contracts. I really like that because it takes this long term vision of transformation, turns it into serious decadal ambition and then brings real contracts near for the pioneers. And to me, it just says Amsterdam saying, hey, business, you are welcome to do business in our city. But if you want to stick around, you've got to get circular. And it creates these really long, loud legal messages to all business. And again, it comes back to actually the boundaries of the donut. If we give ourselves clear boundaries, that's the boundaries of doing business in, in Amsterdam over the next decade. You want to stay? You know what you've got to do. And I sense there a level of energy amongst students, amongst architects, amongst urban planners that I just don't see in many, many other places because there's a clarity about what we're doing. Now let's go. The students coming out of university saying, you mean I've studied circularity and I, I actually get to do it here? Whereas elsewhere, it's like, yeah, put those dreams in your back pocket and go and get a proper job which should be everywhere now. What do you think? Well, I'm going to push back mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to, because because obviously the, the, the work that I'm doing is around understanding innovations, mm -hmm. under, understanding circular innovations, new innovations. And I, and I see that there's an enormous role for, you know, the corporate world um, to take a lead in this, in this space. And I think that policy and regulation is essential. Don't get me wrong. I'm not dismissing the role that it will play. And I'm equally not dismissing the role of, you know, kind of citizen activity and, and kind of communities of act action. But I really see that it's a resource-based view or a scarce resource-based view. And companies predominantly control, in one way or another, the majority of the resources that they can mobilise 
and if they and if we can imp- appeal to companies in terms of um, addressing this resource management issue that they are all facing, where the cost of resources is going up, the availability of resources is going down, then then hopefully it, it can be a corporate movement. How do you feel about that? Do you, you, what's the role of corporate movements, do you think? Or, or, or is it not pertinent and, and it's definitely a top-down must-do? I think it's all relevant. I think, I think, of course, change, moving towards circularity is in some places being led by people organising circular cafes at the weekend. The fact that we still call them circular cafes at the weekend shows that we don't yet take this seriously. It shouldn't be a cafe at the weekend. It should be somewhere that's city centre open all the time. Um, and yes, companies, but if I, w- I wouldn't want to say government stand back, just let the price rise, let the squeeze go on on copper, let the squeeze go on on lithium, because what's going to happen there is just the massive corporations who have the multinational purchasing power, they have the control of the supply chains, they'll just move in and say, oh, this is the thing to control, and they will just sweep in and everybody else will be squeezed out by them. So I'd, it, it's definitely having a, a pressure on them, sure. And Paul Ehrlich was right, right? There was this bet decades ago about the prices of resources and the mainstream economists said, ah, you know, whenever whenever um, prices rise, somebody will go and discover new stuff and we'll innovate away and prices won't rise in the long term. And they are rising in the long term and resources are uh, becoming scarce. But actually, I'm not ultimately worried about just the sheer scarcity of resources. It's about the damage we do to the living systems at the same time. And they have no price on them. So that's the whole carbon problem. Copper has a price, and so companies will innovate away from it or try and discover more of it. The atmosphere doesn't have a price, and therefore it's not, there's no price mechanism response from companies. So I wouldn't want to rely on that at all on its own. But I also think, well, why not cu- couple that with the regulation that says you just got to, you just got to start. Why, why wait for the market price, which we know only reflects a fraction of what we care about? Why not put in place a regulation that has the long view that says we know we've got to get there anyway? So everybody get moving. And when companies say, ah, oh, the price of something's rising, we need to control that supply chain and the multinationals will move in and control it. It means you then get this idea of circularity within one company, right? And I like, I like telling this story with a hose pipe, right? If, if one company says, okay, I'm making, I don't know, let me say clothing for simplicity. Oh, we need to, um, no, not clothing. Um, I don't know, uh, copper, copper products. And we need to control the world's copper supply. They will try and close their own loop let's use copper and let's make sure all that copper comes back to us and we'll use it again and again. Every company will try and make its own closed loop. Please send the products back to us. Well, the average household in the West owns about 10,000 products. There's no way we're gonna send things back to every single manufacturer. And if and nature would never do this. Nature doesn't you know, turn a daffodil into a daffodil and a peacock into a peacock. Nature does this, nature creates an ecosystem of resource users and building blocks that are then passed through this system. So to me, the circular challenge is how do you make an ecosystem of metals use, of ceramics use, of plastics use, of textiles use? And again, individual companies are never gonna come together to do that. In fact, current anti-monopoly law says they're not allowed, it says you're colluding. If you're talking to each other, colluding. We need state or the, or the industrial level to step in and say, we need you to come together and we need to create an ecosystem. That's why I think the work that some organizations do of mapping the, the, the resource flows in a place helps to take a, a bigger than a one company, bigger than industry view of those resources and say, we need, collectively need to come together and work this out. Now, I really want to know what you think of that and whether you see that emerging or do you think it's actually only going to come through company by company? I don't. Uh... I do see this see it as a systems level problem without a doubt. I think what I have tended to fall back on be, because it's human nature is trying to chop the system up in into a chunk at which, that I can possibly understand. Um, be, because if I let the whole thing expand in the way that your fab, fabulous bit of Lego, whatever it was, expanded um, and, it, and it gets bigger than my head, I, I haven't got any way of referencing it. So I have to bring it down to a size that I can cope with. So I think I'm not invest, interested in operating in a, in a void, most certainly not, or in, in a unique strand where innovation is all about, is, is driven by corporate organizations. But I think I, I am inclined to think that the resource-based issue will start to prevail more and more as we move forward. But that's just my that's that's just kind of the, the viewpoint I've got. What I like about the circular economy as a context is is where we started with you saying we don't know what it is, 
and 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 it shifts and changes in our mind so while i'm happy to to think about uh, a corporate push if you like at the moment doesn't mean that by tomorrow afternoon i won't have come up with a slightly nuanced version especially based on some of the discussion that we're having um uh, where was going to go Let, let's go a little bit down the um tell me what you think greenwashing and has done for the uh, the movement or or has created in terms of barriers and we'll we've got about sort of five minutes left so we'll we'll, we'll head off in that direction great i think greenwashing is a huge threat to certainly what we do on donut economics um plenty of companies would love to stick the donut on their website talk about it in their in their pr i've been approached by banks and fossil fuel companies do you want to do a little video for us and it's like thank you but no thank you you've got a lot of work to do and transform and you can't use this concept in your work so that i'm just talking from the point of view of the donut but on on words words are out there anyone can use words regenerate sustainable it's a huge risk because companies have big teams of people figuring out how do we show how do we do enough work to show that we're part of the transformation but actually still getting the maximum shareholder returns that we want to provide and it's let's dance at that line where it looks like we're transforming and it creates huge cynicism amongst the public who say i can't tell the difference between these things and one of them is actually truly transformed the other is complete cover and i think it creates cynicism among activists and people who dedicate their lives to try, trying to create change. And that's why there's people continually moving through language. So from the point of donut, view of donut economics, what we do is say, no companies can use the concept of the donut publicly, publicly at the moment. We are going to be opening that up into conversations and inviting companies into this space. So again, coming back to the what I was saying about eco-linguistics and framing around regenerate, frame the space around the living world and how the living world actually works in those metrics, in that understanding, and then invite last century's corporations, because the most of them were founded, some big ones I'm talking about, founded last century, invite them into that space and remember that every, everything in the human economy is a humanly designed uh, construct and can be redesigned. And its re design may well be out of date and utterly incompatible with what we now understand we need to do. So then invite business in and ask business to explain how it is going to transform to be part of the dynamics we know we need to create. And business so often is pulled back because of the way it's owned and financed. Here's my favorite signboard for every company. I would say be a detective about that company, whether you work for it, love it, hate it, leaving it, joining it, the CEO or the newest employee. What is its purpose? How does it network with its suppliers and its customers and its industrial allies? And how do they hold it to its purpose? How is it governed and who has voice in that decision making? What are the metrics of success? What are the incentives given to middle management? But crucially, how is it owned? Because how it's owned, whether it's by a venture capital or shareholders or employees or by its customers or by a family, how it's owned profoundly shapes how it's financed and what that finance is expecting or demanding. And so many companies are owned and financed in ways, whether it's through shareholding, through uh, venture capital, and this is very true in the space of a lot of innovation, when it's owned and financed in ways that says, well, I'm just here for the high financial returns, right? I mean, why else would I be here? I want my double digits year on year on year on year. That is gonna totally undermine any true purpose and the word circularity or regenerate gets stuck on the front, but it's not. It's doing the minimum it needs to do to get away with using that language and it's actually extracting finance for those who put money in. So to me, it's crucial to look at this and ask yourself, what is the deep design of an enterprise and can it truly be part of transformation or not? Fantastic. So <clears throat> three things. One, I thought I was doing quite well to have a copy of your book, but clearly your props <laughs> are on a completely different level to mine. So thank you very much for bringing your props. Second thing is I like drinking beer. <clears throat> Why do I like drinking beer? Because it makes my head spin. I haven't had a beer in the last half an hour, but my head is spinning. So I think I should say thank you very much. We've come to the end of our session, Kate. It's been really, really stimulating and thought provoking. Um, I think um, I haven't had a chance to ask uh, as many of the questions that had popped up in the chat as I would have liked, but that's the, uh, that's the chalice of a 30 minute session. Um, I hope the audience have enjoyed themselves. I certainly have. Um, we we have another session under this uh, under this kind of theme this, this afternoon with L Ladea Kosir, who runs a circular economy network. So hopefully we're going to build on some of the things that we've we've heard from Kate. But Kate, thank you very very much for coming along to ISPIM. It's been a thorough pleasure, um, and hopefully our paths will cross in the future. Thank you so much. A real pleasure for me. Of course, 
this prop is, of course, a nifty bit of upcycling. So it's the circular economy all the way. Everybody can make one of these. The, the benefits of lockdown, you end up with everyone in the car. But I really recommend because it's we all like a bit of pop up. Um, we've got to have fun while we reinvent the economy. You know, it's got to be playful. Otherwise, everyone will go home. So thank you very much. Real pleasure joining you all here today. Thank you very much. Bye. Kate, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great. Uh, just brushing the questions, we could dive in so much deeper, but um, I we, really, we really enjoyed that. Could have done a couple of hours, couldn't we? Yes. Same time yes. next year. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm going to pursue you for my own personal mission, but um, I'll let you go now. And uh, thank you very much. And, and on behalf of the organisers as well, the conference organisers. Indeed. Excellent. Thank you to them. You. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.